Kent, why don't you go ahead and get us started this morning? Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Kent Hirschfelder. I'm past chair of the um, St. Louis Kaplan Feldman Holocaust Museum. On behalf of Fell, Friends Enjoying Life, an organization supported by the Merowith Center and the museum with whom Fell is co-sponsoring this program, it is my privilege to welcome you all today to the presentation on the exhibition Auschwitz, Not Long Ago, Not Far Away. This exhibition, which is currently on display at the Union Station in Kansas City, is the most comprehensive exhibition dedicated to the history of Auschwitz and its role in the Holocaust ever presented in North America. Before I introduce our guest speaker, I, I want to put in a plug for a trip to Eastern Europe that my wife and I are co-chairing next summer um, through Federation. We will visit Warsaw, Krakow, Budapest, Vienna, and Prague, obviously going to uh, some of the camps, Auschwitz and, and Theresien, and some of the museums. Uh, Judith is going to post in the chat room uh, the contact information for Karen Rader at Federation, who is coordinating the trip. So if anybody uh, on the call today uh, wants more information about it and a copy of the itinerary, uh, feel free to contact Karen. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Jessica Rockhold. Jessica is the Executive Director of the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education, MCHE. She earned her degrees in modern European history and museum studies with an emphasis in Holocaust history from the University of Kansas. She served as a research assistant to the senior historian of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum before joining the staff of MCHE in 2003. At MCHE, she served as a director of education and the associate director before being named executive director in 2020. It's my pleasure now to introduce Jessica Rockhold uh, for our very, I'm sure, very interesting talk on the on Auschwitz and the exhibition. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure to, to have the opportunity to speak to a group in St. Louis. Um, we, we share so much geography and we, we um, work with a lot of the same teachers as your Holocaust Center and it's, it's wonderful to have this connection. Um, before I start, just a few words about the exhibition and kind of what I was thinking when I put together today's presentation. So the exhibition is currently on display and it will be in Kansas City through, Jan uh, through January 30th, 2022. So we do hope that you'll be able to make the trek down I-70 and, and get here to see it. The exhibition itself is a dense, comprehensive history of actually the entire history of the Holocaust, the entire scope and sequence of events from the the pre-war not uh, the pre-war Jewish experience and anti-Semitism, all the way through the radicalization of Nazi policy towards the Jews. It is centered around Auschwitz, and I've chosen to center my talk today around the history of Auschwitz as it's presented in the exhibition. And uh, I, I just want you to be aware, though, that if you come to Kansas City to see this exhibition you will be seeing a complete history of the Holocaust as you walk through those halls. So today though, we're gonna be looking at Auschwitz as a complex and how it develops from a small place of relatively um, small importance within the Nazi universe to the icon of the Holocaust. As any good discussion of the Holocaust always does, our exhibition centers on stories. So it is about personalizing this history, making sure that facts and figures and impact are understood through the lens of the people that experienced it. And by the people that experienced it, we mean both the victims of the Holocaust and the people who perpetrated it. So I start us here in what is essentially the first room of the exhibition. As you walk in, the first thing you encounter are the victims and the perpetrators as represented through these two items a single shoe worn by one individual Jewish woman who came to Auschwitz not knowing what her, what her fate would be. And then you see on the right there, the wheel set of a train car that brought people to their death, representing the mechanisms of the perpetrators, the people, the industry, the industrial might behind the Holocaust. Auschwitz itself, again, I want to reemphasize is a complete complex. 
when we talk about Auschwitz or when a survivor talks about Auschwitz, in most cases, they're talking about what we uh, more specifically call Auschwitz-Birkenau, which is the second camp at Auschwitz and it's the death camp within the Auschwitz complex. I'm sorry, I just got muted, <laughs> I'm back. Um, what we're looking at are three primary camps, Auschwitz I, which functions as a concentration camp, Auschwitz II, which is also called Auschwitz-Birkenau, which is the death facility, Auschwitz III, which is actually an IG, IG Farben factory, also called Buna Monowitz, and then dozens of subcamps. And it is partially because of this incredibly dense structure, how many facilities, how many slave, slave labor facilities were attached to Auschwitz, that we have survivors of Auschwitz. We'll talk a little bit later about how few survivors there are from other death camps. Auschwitz does have thousands of survivors, and it's one of the reasons that it has become iconic. We have testimony, we have living witnesses who can speak to the experience and the conditions of this one very unique place. It's very important in the scope of the exhibition and in the curator's mind that people really are able to place Auschwitz on a map and that it is understood that this is a place that existed and had a history and had a thriving Jewish community before it was Auschwitz the death camp. So they take great care to talk about the town of Auschwitz and how it was a predominantly Jewish community. It was a place that had a thriving community uh, that had experienced its own set of turmoils before World War II and the Holocaust. It was a place that had transferred um, governmental control multiple times. It's an area that is relatively close to the German border. And it's an area of Poland that comes under different governmental structures at different times throughout its history. And because of that influx of different influences, that rich, vibrant kind of intertwining of cultures is present in this community. And thinking about this was home to an entire group of people, Poles, Jews, native Germans in some cases. So before it was Auschwitz, it was Auschwitz. And it gets caught up as it had so many times in the previous years at the beginning of World War II in this pull and this struggle for land. So it is part of the German vision for Lebensraum. It is a place that is going to be annexed into Germany. This is not an area of Poland that falls under the general government. Once the Nazis take control, it is actually annexed into German um, governmental authority. And it is literally renamed. It is no longer Auschwitz. It is now Auschwitz, which then lends its name to the camp structure that is going to be posted nearby. What we know about the camp is that originally it was envisioned as a small, relatively insignificant place. Uh, Rudolf Hess, who we'll talk about in a minute, was tasked with finding a location for a, a camp that would function along the lines of a place like Dachau had outside of Munich. It was meant to be a penal facility, a concentration facility. And what he found when he went to Auschwitz was this set of Polish army barracks. It had been in use with the Polish army. It was relatively well-maintained. It, it needed help, it needed um, repairs. They, they had to do a great deal of work on it, but it was intact enough that Hess identified this location as a place where he could house that kind of a concentration camp. And that's what they set about doing. They reinforced the buildings, they built the barbed wire, they put up the fences. And what you get then is this relatively small, geographically small concentration camp that is opened on, it, it opens on May 1st, 1940, but it accepts its first prisoners on May 20th. And the very first prisoners at Auschwitz were not Jews. This was not a camp that was designated and, and in fact, there is no final solution in 1940. So uh, Polish Jews are in ghettos, German Jews are still in their homes if they have not immigrated. So this is a moment 
where the concentration camps are focusing on uh, real or perceived criminals, political opponents, and others that are um, destined for what the Nazis termed re-education. So the initial prisoners are um, criminals uh, that had been pulled from jails and then sent to Auschwitz I, and then some Polish political prisoners who end up in Auschwitz. The first commandant and the most important man in the history of Auschwitz's evolution and, and growth is the first commandant. His name is Rudolf Hess. And he is a man who was an early adherent to the Nazi party. He was a man who had come up through the Dachau camp system. So he received his training at Dachau. His first station was at Dachau. He was then at a series of other German concentration camps. But um, one of the iconic things about Auschwitz is the Arbeit Macht Frei gate that we saw just a moment ago, the arch. That's actually at the Auschwitz I camp, not at the Birkenau camp. And it is brought to Auschwitz by Hess because that was the camp motto at Dachau. So you see here a photo of Arbeit Macht Frei on a gate at Dachau. That is his influence and the influence of that kind of a camp structure. Because again, those kinds of camps, while there was certainly to torture, there was certainly murder, the purpose was different. It was destined as a re-education facility. Here you see, and, and you will see through this entire presentation, artifacts that are featured in the exhibition, uh, Auschwitz not long ago, not far away. So this is Rudolf Hess's desk where he sat and with the stroke of a pen uh, enacted these decisions and put this place on a map. And uh, here you see a, a calendar off of, off of somebody's desk. The very ordinary instruments of a man doing his job, but in this case, his job is um, incarceration leading toward what will become genocide. The first prisoners in this Auschwitz concentration camp were primarily non-Jews. There could be a Jew in this camp, but they weren't there because they were Jewish. They would have been there because they were deemed a political enemy or picked up for some other reason. Largely, they were Polish people who were identified as resistance leaders or the intelligentsia who might be able to mount some sort of a resistance to the Germans in some way during the early occupation period. At this time, there is no systemic policy of murder People are murdered, people do die from conditions, but it's not a murder policy like we're going to see in Birkenau. Uh, prisoners are processed in and their numbers are given to them in a way um, on, their, on their uniform. You can see here in this painting, these are political prisoners. And here you see a uniform that's in the, the exhibition. These are people who the red, the red triangle denotes they were political prisoners and their numbers were not tattooed onto them they were put onto their uniforms. You will also see in the exhibition, these very famous mug shots. And one of the things that we all know is that when we reach the Birkenau period, when Jews are being deported to their deaths, there is no registration of people who are sent immediately to their death. And there are not mug shot photos of people who are processed into Birkenau. That's very different from this early period where people are processed almost in a criminal way. They are processed in with photographs and paperwork that document who they are, where they came from, and what their perceived offense is. And that paperwork is a very important part of the archive at Auschwitz. Uh, here are again, just, just more of the mugshots. I'm sure you're familiar with these. Part of the thinking behind the design of these concentration camps is providing a, a forced labor pool for various industries that are tying themselves to the SS through the economic wing, the WVHA. So sometimes these are armaments or war related productions, but essentially that's the function. They, they are willing to kill people, they are willing to torture people, but they are very much interested in providing labor for these systems and in turn profiting from that labor. The SS are paid for the, paid the wages that these people would have earned. The first expansion of this system is again, not designed to kill, it's designed to enrich the Nazis. 
So Auschwitz had originally been um, identified as an ideal place for a concentration camp because of its location. It was situated at the confluence of a couple of major rivers. It had good rail access. It had good natural resources around it. And that is exactly what caught the eye of the IG Farben Company, who decided that they wanted to locate a major factory within the concentration camp complex to utilize that slave labor that Auschwitz had to offer. You see here that the water, coal, and lime deposits that are naturally occurring in the Auschwitz region are exactly the ingredients that you need to generate synthetic rubber. So this is what Farben was aiming at. And as a result of their negotiations with the SS, Himmler agrees to infuse very significant capital. You can see 600 million Reichmarks, which in 1941 was very significant capital, and truly invest in making this a permanent factory complex that they would then seed with this slave labor. Interestingly, um, Farben is never fully built and it is kind of always in evolution. So if you read survivor testimonies like uh, Primo Levi, Primo Levi is a prisoner in Auschwitz, but he works in Bunamonowitz. He is a chemist by trade and his assignment in Auschwitz was to work at the Farben plant. And so you will find stories of survivors who talk about how they were housed in Birkenau and had to march to work at the Buna complex until, until much later when the barracks are built. And actually, if you come to Kansas City and see the exhibition, the barracks that are in the exhibition are part of the Buna complex uh, barracks. There are, are multiple points of radicalization in the Holocaust, and most are in some way tied to the fortunes of the military war. And the same is true of the evolution of Auschwitz. So a critical turning point for the thinking of what the Nazis needed to gain out of this system was Operation Barbarossa, which is the invasion of the Soviet Union in June of 1941. When that invasion occurs, it is a blitzkrieg attack. Uh, it is a very quick ground invasion. They're covering vast swaths of land very, very quickly. And what we know is that for Auschwitz in particular, it was going to be important that Soviet prisoners of war be housed at Auschwitz. That was the, the intention. So in a relatively small complex, Rudolf Hess is now looking at what they perceive to be potentially hundreds of thousands of Soviet POWs that will be coming to his facility. I'll, I'll come back to that in one moment. In addition to the POWs, what is happening to the Jewish community with the invasion of the Soviet Union is that small shooting units called Einsatzgruppen, which are connected to that moving front, are operating immediately behind the Wehrmacht, and they are going into every small village and shooting the Jewish and the Roma and the political, and the political um, resistors in the Soviet space. We call this the Holocaust by bullets. Um, again, some of the, the pieces, some of the references that you will see in the exhibition are, are here. This is a photograph of women and children being held as they wait their turn for execution near the ocean in Leopaya, Latvia. And these are shell casings which were collected by Yahad and Unum, which is the um, organization started by Father Patrick Dubois which is uh, working in Eastern Europe to identify as many of these shooting locations and mass burial sites as possible. And that's what you see here on this map is that essentially there is not a spot of ground in Eastern Europe that is not touched by the Holocaust by bullets. And that this is going to have an enormous impact on what comes next for Auschwitz. Because what this demonstrates is that a decision has been taken in Berlin that genocide is going to occur. They have made the decision to kill the Jews of Europe. And that is again going to shift the, the purpose of Auschwitz and cause them to evolve and expand. So the killing process is very efficient in the East. 
They are killing, uh, they succeed in killing a million and a half people this way. But it, it, let me rephrase that, it is effective. It is not efficient. They want a more physically removed method of killing people. They want something that is less labor intensive. So they're, they're experimenting. They're trying things with gas. They have gas fans that they've um, experimented with and utilized in the T4 program. And in a place like Auschwitz and Majdanek, we're going to see the evolution of the use of Zyklon B. In Auschwitz, we see this very early actually, and it is, um, it's very much a workplace story. Hess was away, Hess had been called to a meeting and he was out of the complex. And one of his lieutenants decided to be industrious and try something. And so Zyklon B was a legitimate delousing agent that was in the camps. They used it to fumigate, to kill lice. And it occurred to this man named Fritsch that perhaps he could kill people this way. So in Auschwitz I, they placed you know, a few hundred sick uh, Soviet POWs and Poles, and they threw some gas into the basement. And it was very, very efficient and effective. And when Hess came back, he was presented with this evidence. And there was kind of an immediate acceptance that this would be an acceptable and useful way to deal with what they were now going to be asked to do. This quote from Hess, I think we have to take um, with a very big grain of salt, but I think there's also a lot of truth in it. This is from his own memoir, which he wrote after he had been convicted and was waiting execution in 1946. And essentially what he's saying is that he is relieved that his deputy has solved this problem for him because he was worried about the potential of being pressed into service and shooting actions because his understanding of what the Einsatzgruppen was dealing with was that it was uh, psychologically traumatic. And he was correct about that. The grain of salt here, of course, is that I don't think we can say that there's truth in him being worried about the Jewish experience of how they would experience their murder. So having arrived at a method, they're still operating in a very small space. And so what they do is they retrofit a morgue in Auschwitz I. It's a small building that they were using to literally just collect the bodies of deceased prisoners who had died of either attrition or an occasional shooting. Um, and they had a very small cremation chamber. You see here, it, it only had a couple of reports. So it was, um, a building that was already being used to kind of facilitate um, a murder process, but on a very, very small scale. But it is then pressed into service as the first gas chamber at Auschwitz. And for a while, that is their entire gassing operation. At the same time that this kind of innovation in technique is happening, they are planning and they are working on expansion and this is where we get to Birkenau. Birkenau is conceived as a place that is going to initially house these Soviet POWs that kind of never happen. The, the numbers just don't end up being what the Nazis anticipated. But they do utilize the slave labor of the Soviets that they received to build Birkenau. So again, this was a community. It was a, a small village. They dismantled it and they put up what we now think of as Auschwitz-Birkenau in that space. This becomes the death center of Auschwitz. It is a major complex of multiple barracks, um, multiple cremation units, um, and a machine essentially that, that pulls whatever economic value it can out of the arriving Jewish community and then filters it back into the Reich. So we're gonna talk about all of those components. So that's late 1941. We know the decision's been made that they're going to kill the Jews. We know that they are in practice already putting in the steps that they need to accomplish mass murder. They're researching and arriving on their method of gas. They're building the facilities they need. By January of 1942, 
We've had the Wannsee Conference meeting, which is a meeting of high German officials, where they are essentially pulled together by the SS and told what their role is in helping to facilitate the collection and deportation of the Jewish community of Europe. This is where we get to what the exhibition calls the unique crime. Up until this point, the Nazis have not really invented anything new. They have not done something to the Jewish community that has not been done to it in its history. There have been ghettos before. There have been all of the kinds of persecution and smaller scale murder in Jewish history that we've seen up to this point. What we've arrived at with the Wannsee Conference and the establishment of these six killing facilities is the unique crime of the Holocaust. Within the exhibition, the way that story is told is that you walk through that previous history. You, you talk about ghettos and early Auschwitz and you talk about um, the Einsatzgruppen and, and you reach the point where you as the visitor walk up a ramp and you then stand at these jackboots, which represent the Nazi officer or the Nazi doctor who met that Jewish person at the ramp. And then you make a turn and you go down a ramp into the, um, the story of Auschwitz as a death camp, which you see here in the picture on the right, people walking towards their death in an industrialized gas chamber. What people often miss though, is that there's yet another step at Auschwitz. We had the morgue, the retrofitted crematorium one at Auschwitz one, but initially through most of 1942, from about February 1942 to about March 1943, Auschwitz is actually operating out of two retrofitted farmhouses. They called them the Little Red and the Little White Houses. They were just outside the fence, outside the perimeter of what we think of as the Birkenau um, complex. And they, they were compared to the capacity that we come to expect of Auschwitz, killing very few people at a time. These are literally farmhouses. They plug up the windows, they hermetically seal doors, and they, they make it as airtight as possible so that the Zyklon is working in the space, but this is not the Auschwitz that people think of. And for over a year, this is how Auschwitz is killing people. Uh, it, just for the sake of clarity, neither of these structures exist anymore. These are, um, these are recreations. At the same time that this is happening at Auschwitz, and I think this is a very important kind of um, parallel for people to understand, Operation Reinhardt is occurring. Operation Reinhardt is the murder of Polish Jewry. So the Jews who had already been concentrated into ghettos and were very easily accessible to Nazi deportation efforts. This is um, of the six concentration camps, three of them fall under the um, administration of Operation Reinhardt, Belzec, Sobibor, and Treblinka. And you see here that they are operating at the exact same times as those two farmhouses in Auschwitz. So again, just as a point of comparison to, to help you kind of um, conceptualize the really radical change Auschwitz goes through. Belzec is the, the first big camp to come online. You can see here um, sorry, I have to move my box, that um, based on a very specific document, our best evidence is that they killed 434, 508,000 people as a very specific number, but, um, a story for a different day, a fascinating document that gives that very specific number with two known survivors. So we bore potentially up to a quarter million people with 50 known survivors. And then Treblinka. I want us to spend a few minutes on Treblinka because there are estimates that put the Treblinka death toll as potentially as high as a million. Um, the, the most widely quoted figure is over 900,000, which is nearly the, nearly the number that we see at Auschwitz with somewhere between 60 and 100 survivors. But they are doing this without the benefit of the industrial capacity of Auschwitz. So I wanna just take a minute to explain Treblinka so that you can see why what Auschwitz becomes is so extraordinary. 
Treblinka is the designated camp for the Warsaw Ghetto. And you can see here a rather significant population of Jews in the center of Poland. So it's a very densely populated Jewish center. And those people are all going to be um, deported to Treblinka. By the standard of what we will see in a minute on the Birkenau map, Treblinka is a fairly small camp. It has a, a very small prisoner population, just a few hundred people. So it's a very small living space. And then it has a death camp portion. Some of the techniques that we're going to see employed at Auschwitz in terms of um, dishonesty with the arriving Jews, kind of trying to keep calm and um, facilitate their movement through the system is designed at Treblinka. So for instance, we see an arrival platform where there's an immediate ruse about you're going for disinfection and here's how you're going to move through the system and then reclaim your belongings, those kinds of, of uh, lies. Um, a, a small shooting facility for those who are non-ambulatory and can't make it to the death portion, a very small arrival and disrobing site. But you see here compared to the structure that we see at Auschwitz, that this is primitive. These are, these are small, these are wooden, these are not meant to last and to stay. Again, a small, a very small labor um, core that was only there in service of facilitating death and of sorting belongings. There is no slave labor facility attached to any of these Operation Reinhardt camps, which is why the survivor population is so small compared to a place like Auschwitz. Unlike Auschwitz, which utilized Zyklon B, the Operation Reinhardt camps used carbon monoxide. And as such, part of the thinking, part of the mechanism that the Nazis employed was creating these winding paths that the Jews were pushed through. They were beaten and made to run, uh, forcing them to breathe heavily so that when they reached the gas chamber, they would inhale more deeply and succumb to the gas more quickly. And this is what, again, Treblinka is no longer standing. So these are digital reconstructions, but this is what gas chambers look like at Treblinka. And think in your mind, as, a, as opposed to what you know about Auschwitz, how simple and rather primitive this looks compared to the industrial might of Auschwitz. Um, I'm not gonna belabor this. The point is that they, even they go through a series of evolutions. So the entire story of the final solution is about the Nazis having a directive from the top. Berlin says, we are going to murder the Jews. But the implementation oftentimes happens from the ground up. They have a system, it doesn't work. They make an innovation, they implement it. They, they continue to tweak and to evolve as they go. That happens at Treblinka and we'll see it happen at Auschwitz. The major deportations. And then finally uh, ended by a revolt, which will also mirror the Auschwitz experience of the, the gas chambers. So once, they, uh, once the small prisoner population that lived in Treblinka was aware of the fact that deportations had slowed and that their labor was no longer necessary, they understood that their moment to revolt was now or never. And so they found a way to revolt. And um, after that, the, the camp was raised and a farmer was, was placed on the grounds. What I want you to get out of this as we go into this next section about the evolution of Auschwitz is that this very primitive system, while Auschwitz was operating in two farmhouses, killed nearly a million people in 13 months. Treblinka is the deadliest place on earth in human history until Auschwitz. So what makes Auschwitz so unique even in this unique system? Auschwitz represents Germany harnessing all of the resources of a modern government, all of the resources of the industrial revolution, all of the resources of modernity and putting them in service of murder and genocide. So here as a, for instance, you see 
And, and there are so many of these. We, we could pull them up for so many of the buildings at Auschwitz, but these are engineered. A place like Crematoria II does not exist. Nobody has built something like this in human history. It has to be literally engineered from the ground up and then trouble shot. So the ingenuity here are these four complexes. These all reside at Auschwitz-Birkenau. They're called Crema two, three, four, and five. Um, they're very similar in design. The difference is two and three had subterranean gas chambers, whereas four and five um, was all above ground. That simply ended up being a financial decision. They kind of ran out of their budget for the subterranean part. But these are, again, some, something new, something engineered. So what we see is an innovation in how to deliver gas to large quantities of people. So one of the things you'll see in the exhibition um, are these white models. These are all architectural recreations that were done by Dr. Robert Jan van Pelt and his architecture students. And they are meant to give us a very clear understanding of these um, kind of complicit industrial interests that somebody had to come to these places and build these things, put them on, on the map. They didn't exist. So how do you hermetically seal a door and leave the people? That was a thing. How, how do you do that? How do you effectively deliver gas into a subterranean facility? This column was the answer. And in fact, there's fascinating information in the exhibit about, you can't see it in this photograph, but there's a small basket that actually lowers within this column that is part of the delivery mechanism to disseminate the gas. So understanding that these are very unique um, innovations. Here we have, and I'm sure that many of you have seen this, the, this model is recreated in multiple places. There's one at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Of course, there's one at Auschwitz, but this is a model of crematoria too. So here we see people um, in this photograph being sent into the subterranean undressing chamber, which we see here. So people were undressed and told, you know, tie your shoes together, remember your hook number, that kind of thing. You're going to a shower. But as they turn the corner, this is the gas chamber and here you see, um, you can see these columns. So here would be the, the ground level entry point where the SS man would put the gas into that basket and lower it. I think it's always just good to, to share numbers and let, let people see. Um, one of the questions we get a lot is how, ma how many people can Auschwitz kill in a day? The question is really not how many can they kill. The question is how many could they burn? And so uh, the killing capacity is actually much more significant than their process per day because what they learned as they, as they engineered and built these facilities is that they had cremation difficulties. So the firm Topfensons, who was a legitimate business, a, a cremation firm in Germany. So like you you may have a loved one who, who passes away and, and you wanna have their remains cremated for, for burial. That's what they did in Germany. But when they were contracted to build these facilities in Auschwitz, um, they were faced with several dilemmas, some of them ethical, understanding that there's no way that any place could need this kind of a capacity for legitimate reasons. And some of them practical. You can literally only uh, burn this many bodies because of the heat that's created, because of what it will do to the chimney and the furnace system. So what we have is all sorts of evidence of these industrial interests going back to Auschwitz after building these facilities and then servicing them. And we have conversations that essentially go, you're, you're going to have to pay for this. Your warranty isn't good because you didn't use it the way we told you to use it as they're repairing the crematorium at Auschwitz. In building Birkenau, which becomes the biggest part of Auschwitz, we have the four crematoria, which you can see here kind of along uh, this left edge, two, three, four, and five. The women's camp, which is to the left of the rail spur, 
And then this huge section of barracks, which is largely the men's camp, but then also serves a couple of other functions that we'll talk about later. And then you can see here this section, Mexico, which was under construction, which tells you that they were still planning to expand, that they had more plans for Auschwitz beyond the murder of the Jews of Europe. And um, for those of you who know the story of the Verba Wexler report, the, the two men who escape and try to get testimony to the Hungarians before their deportation, um, that is how they escape. They make it to the Mexico section, that unfinished section of Birkenau, and that's how they facilitate their escape. Um, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna speak about this in depth because I just told the top fun sons story. But um, in terms of industrial interests and and people who knew there was no legitimate use for the the product that they were creating, we have correspondence and receipts and all sorts of evidence about how the Zyklon gets to Auschwitz and how it was specifically um, re-engineered to remove the warning smell. So it, it's a chemical, as a, as a company, Zyklon would want there to be a warning smell so that if people accidentally came in contact with it, they would be alerted and how that was removed for the mass gassings at Auschwitz. And it's to this system that these Jewish communities were brought. Um, by and large, Auschwitz is the catchment for occupied Europe. The Polish Jews had primarily been sent to the Operation Reinhardt camps. Um, some approximately 300,000 Polish Jews do go to Auschwitz, largely on internal transports. So we have a story of one of our local survivors who was in Majdanek, but she ends up in Auschwitz being transferred from Majdanek. So that is more um, typical of how a Polish Jewish person would get to Auschwitz. But most of these other countries, they are direct deportations. You can just see some of the numbers here. And I wanna talk about that Jewish experience of Auschwitz because um, it, it's always, in my opinion, critical when you're teaching the history to humanize it. It's one thing to talk about these industrial concerns and what the Nazis were thinking, but how was it experienced by the people? So um, the example that we will use is the Hungarian deportations because of the evidence we have for it. And the photographs lend us a way to talk about this experience, but it would have been experienced this way by all of the Jews arriving once Auschwitz is operating in this way. So you were very familiar with the arrival process. They are pulled off the trains and sorted and the majority are sent directly to their deaths while the, the much smaller minority is processed into the camp as laborers. The process of being processed, the, uh, of being taken into the camp, of being brought into slave labor, they are marched to the sauna, which is very near crematoria four, where they are stripped and shaved and tattooed and given um, what one of my survivors calls a little trickly shower. So, um, you know, en enough water to make you very uncomfortable, essentially. Uh, this is the period of tattooing at Auschwitz. And Auschwitz is the only camp, death camp, concentration camp. It's the only camp in the Nazi system that is tattooing its prisoners. Having been through that kind of um, stripping and uh, processing in, they are then given their uniforms, which again, everybody here is probably very familiar with. But the point of all of this is that within a few short minutes, they've been stripped of their identity. They've lost their name. They're now a number. They've lost their clothes. They've lost their hair. And what we hear so often for survivors is for the women, they tend to focus on the shaving of their hair. There is something about um, not recognizing each other and, and feeling so kind of exposed with having lost their hair that is a real loss of identity for them. For men, they tend to tell us more about the tattooing. That, that seems to be more prominent in their testimony as the moment that they felt stripped of something, that they had lost something. The prisoners really facilitate life in Auschwitz. There are not enough Nazi guards 
to make everything happen. And so what we get is a system that relies on capos, which are prisoners who are elevated to a higher rank. In many cases, those might be um, green triangles, which would have been German criminals, sometimes political prisoners. It's rare, but not, not um, unheard of that there would be Jewish capos. But essentially these are prisoners who are elevated to a status above the people that they are overseeing and they report directly to the SS guards. Um, it, it's simply too many people for the SS to oversee themselves. It's a very complex plex system, it's hierarchical, and it's operating in both the men's and the women's camps. Food is something that, again, survivors will talk about with, um, with words that don't really you, you can tell they're struggling for words because the words don't mean enough. Saying I was hungry doesn't convey what that felt. Um, so very restricted rations, um, mostly bread that was very sawdusty, watery soup that you might have a nasty potato peel in, uh, very occasional um, substance, but very rare. And this is a source of great conflict among the prisoners. And often uh, when there are skirmishes among them, it is over food. It is that somebody has organized in Camp Lingo um, something, and that often means it was taken from somebody else. So uh, food is a, a particular theme in, in the Holocaust, in Auschwitz, and in survivor testimony. When we think about labor, again, some of this was tied to industry. Many of the Jews in Auschwitz were sent to the IG Farben complex every day to work. Uh, many were going to the dozens of sub camps. Um, our, our founder, MCHE's founder was in Blackhammer, which is one of the sub camps of Auschwitz where he was a laborer. So it's a system where every day you were given this completely inadequate food and then you were sent out for hours of backbreaking labor that it's, it's not enough to sustain life. Which was exactly the point. The Nazis literally had a phrase for this for Nikdung Durek Arbeit, which means annihilation through work. There is policy document that states that the, the average life expectancy was two to three months once you had been taken into slave labor. It's death by attrition, essentially. We will, we will use all of the resources that your body can provide to the Nazis, and then you will die, is, is the policy. Um, one of what would be considered a, the good jobs, and good jobs were always inside jobs, was to be assigned to Canada. Canada was a warehouse section at Auschwitz that um, was the repository for the goods brought to Auschwitz by the deportees. So anything that was in their suitcases, essentially, the, the clothes on their backs was taken to Canada where it was sorted. And these are, these are all straight out of the exhibition. This is the humanity of, of the place. This is what is left of the people who came there. So this is an example of some of the most precious possessions that they still had. What do you take if you think you're going to the East to work and you're potentially not coming home for years or never coming home? You take the most precious things you have left. So these are the items that ended up in Canada. And you see here these two women. Um, I don't know if you can see it on the presentation on your screen, but if you came to the exhibition, you'd be able to get close enough to the photograph to see that they're both smiling. They both survived the war and tell the story of being forced to pose for this photograph and to smile for it and how very vividly they remember that day. But working in Canada was not only largely inside work, but it gave them the ability to organize and take um, needed items back into the barracks. So the, the people who worked in Canada were absolutely critical to the black market and to food circulation within Auschwitz-Birkenau. Auschwitz is also famous for its medical experiments. So for those uh, very few who were pulled to temporarily stay alive at Auschwitz, another very small subset of those people would have been destined for medical experimentation. Um, twins, 
um, little people, other people that um, for one reason or another, they wanted to, to run some tests on or to experiment on. This is Dr. Carl Klauberg and Dr. Joseph Mengele. And uh, this, this medical table is actually, again, an exhibition, but an important, an important legacy of the Holocaust, an important legacy of Auschwitz is medical ethics. And um, what do you do with the information you gain that was gained because it was perpetrated on living victims? We've spoken rather extensively about the Jews. I'd also like to take just a, a few moments to talk about the experience of the Roma in Auschwitz. The Roma experience of the Holocaust uh, most closely um, parallels the Jewish experience. It was uh, meant to be a genocidal experience. So within Auschwitz, there is a very specific Jewish, uh, excuse me, what they call the gypsy family camp. You see it there kind of at the top of the barrack set, this yellow section. So for the Roma who were sent to Auschwitz, uh, they were placed in a family complex. They were not segregated. They were not, um, they were not put through a selection process. They were all sent directly to this, this family camp. Some 23,000 from um, two or three different, um, different gr um, kind of ethnic groupings. And they were not subjected to labor. They stayed in the family camp and they were subjected to very difficult living conditions. They had no extra access to food because they weren't going out to work. They had no extra access to clothing or material because they had no access to Canada. So the conditions in that camp deteriorated very quickly and you um, had very significant contagious diseases that ran through that. There were two times that that camp was meant to be liquidated. One was in early May, 1944, and it correlated with the arrival of the, of the first Hungarian transports, understanding that they were about to receive 400,000 Jewish people from Hungary there was interest in Auschwitz to kind of free up some space. And so they um, thought, well, we'll liquidate the, the gypsy camp. And what happened is that somebody tipped off the camp and they fought back. They didn't have much to fight back with. It was rocks and sticks essentially, but they fought back enough that the, that the SS just kind of backed out and decided not to deal with it. And it was on August 2nd then that they went in and actually fully liquidated the camp. This is something that you'll see spoken about in um, Jewish survivor testimony. They'll, they'll talk very vividly about their recollections of the night that the gypsy camp was liquidated, the fire, the sounds, um, and understanding what was happening to that camp. The, the exhibition also talks um, very eloquently about resistance in Auschwitz and in its many forms. Um, so one of the things that we talk about in Holocaust education is spiritual resistance and personal resistance, the small ways that you stay alive or maintain your beliefs. But then there were also these very overt, coordinated activities. So these are the photographs of the Sonder Commando, who were attempting to document the destruction of the Hungarian Jews and smuggle those to the outside world in the hope that um, somebody would at least know what was happening and at best intervene. And it was the Sonder Commando again, who actually uh, attacked the crematoria complexes and essentially put them out of commission. It was in October of uh, 1944. So very, very late in the war when the Hungarian operation was already over. And for the most part, the Nazis, um, Himmler in particular had a, a very clear understanding that the Nazis had lost the war. And um, their success in destroying crematoria four and disrupting the operations in the other crematoria essentially set, set Auschwitz on a path to um, decommissioning those crematoria and stopping gassing operations. By January, the, the Soviet front is creeping in and the death marches occur. So we have the, the removal of the majority 
of prisoners from Auschwitz put on roads and then on open rail cards to the German concentration camps. And so when the Soviets arrive in Auschwitz, it's very much the story of liberation in the East. They are liberating the space, but not the people. For the most part, the people are gone. They are removed from the space. The Nazis have literally killed them or just pulled them into the interior of Germany. Of the six death camps, four were closed before they could be liberated. Only Majdanek and Auschwitz are liberated somewhat intact. At Auschwitz, they come in on January 27th and they find about 7,000 um, ill and non-ambulatory um, and, and some very young uh, survivors. The army is not there long. It, it is a fast moving front. They are not equipped to support the survivors that they find significantly in the way that the Western allies are in, in the West as the war is winding down. But they do do some very important things. First of all, they document a great many things. They take photographs, some of which are, uh, I don't want to use the word staged, recreated. Um, they have artists who are affiliated with them. And, and some of these drawings are in the exhibition. Um, these artists were part of their documentation crew, as I might say, a propaganda crew but their job was to draw what they saw as they liberated these spaces. They did conduct burials for those that had been alive, but um, died after, after their liberation. And they gave some support to the survivors they found. Our survivors will tell stories about being given a little bit of food, sometimes being given a ride to the next town sometimes spending a night in an army encampment where they you know, were given a little bit like a blanket and some access to the fire. But essentially the survivors in the East are largely left to their own devices to try to find their way. They're trying to go back home. They're trying to go home and see if anybody else has survived. The other thing the Soviets do, and I put in the entire title or most of the entire title, it actually goes on for two more lines, but because I love Soviet titles, but they actually form a governmental commission to investigate the fascist crimes. Now, we all understand that um, the Soviet Union has its own political issues, but what they do is set in motion a series of investigations that compile a great deal of evidence about what happened because the Americans never reached this space. The British never reached this space. They never have access to places like Auschwitz. So here we have, um, they're doing post-mortems on bodies that they found. They are collecting evidence of, at the destroyed crematoria sites. They're understanding the engineering. They're collecting um, the paperwork that was left behind. And they put that together into a report. Now, what is interesting about the report is that there is no recognition of the unique Jewish nature of the crime at Auschwitz. Uh, victims are listed by their nationalities and only their nationalities. So uh, a French Jew would be listed as a victim from France, not that they were in Auschwitz because they were deported as a Jewish person. Again, I always like to leave people with a, a little food for thought, a little frame of reference on the numbers. This gives you some sense of who was taken to Auschwitz. So even all of, all of the early period where it was primarily Polish or pri primarily um, criminals, that still doesn't skew the numbers. It is a Jewish space. This is where Jews were sent to experience this genocide that the Nazi government had set in place. And then if you look at who was murdered, you see that that very closely correlates to the percentages that we just saw. Um, but it also gives you a sense of the mortality rate. And what I'd like to leave you with then is um, bringing it back to the exhibition and how uh, the exhibition opens with this Primo Levi quote, and it closes with a Shah Delbo quote. And um, Auschwitz not long ago, not far away, is 
profound and meaningful. Michael Berenbaum uh, recently described it as essentially an, an indictment that this is still something that we haven't kind of addressed. We still allow these things to happen, that this story shouldn't be relevant in the 21st century, and it is, and that's our fault. So on the one hand, this is a call to action. And on the other, it is um, asking people to maintain the humanity of this story. Uh, this is an artifact that particularly speaks to me in the exhibition. Um, I have heard two men go through the exhibit and explain that this is a shoe that a little boy tucked his sock into. And I have to tell you that that may be absolutely correct, but as a mother, what I see here is, you know, some, some little boy took off his shoe and his mom put his sock in. But either way, this is one child, one life, and bringing this story, the enormity of this, and thinking about how this happened at Auschwitz to a million plus people. It, it's, a, it's a story that happened that many times. So that's why I'd like to leave you with today. Or, or Jessica, are you going to have time for a question or two? I know there were some in the chat. I, I think that Judith was going to ask me some questions, yes. Okay. Judith, were you going to? Sorry, I can I ask him. I'm sorry, my I was on mute. Hold on one second. So uh, yes, we do. Um, we have the first one was you, from you, Kent. It was so you had said recent research indicates that there were 42,000 camps of various types and sizes during the Holocaust. Can you comment on that? Right. So you're referring to the um, the big study that was done at USHMM. It was led by uh, my my friend Jeff McGargy, who um, was in charge of trying to identify each camp. And by camp, that means any place that um, housed, imprisoned, utilized forced labor. So it's a very inclusive um, catchment, but it's completely revolutionized the way that we as a field think about the Holocaust. Um, there are literally no corners of, of Europe that were not touched by this. If there are 42 to 44,000 camps, that means this is everywhere, it's pervasive. And yet within that, we know that there are only six death camps. So how, it, it kind of heightens the priority of what those six camps were, that within these 42,000, these six had this role. Thank you. The next one comment is from Jerry Rinaldi. Jessica, after your years of Holocaust study, what was something new that you learned from the exhibition? And P.S., one of the many Zoom meetings on many topics I've attended during the pandemic, yours has been the most well-organized, engaging, and informative by far. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. What have you learned? <laughs> what have I learned? Um, I'm going to tell you about one of my favorite pieces, and I, the, I'm cheating a little bit, but um, there is within the exhibition. If you come to the Kansas City version of it, every every installation is a little bit unique to the community that it's in. So when I saw this exhibition in New York there was a piece that was actually part of the Museum of Jewish Heritage's um, collection. And it did not travel to Kansas City, but it was so impactful and so important in telling the story that the curator added a, um, a light box recreation of it. And what it is, it's an imperial proclamation. I can't remember what year it's from, but it's imperial proclamation um, persecuting Jews from a previous time and forcing them to wear an identifying badge. And it's particularly significant because it is something that Reinhard Heydrich acquired and gifted to Himmler as a birthday present. And what struck me, I'm always struck by the humanity of the perpetrators. I think it's so important for us as learners 
to not see them as monsters, but to see them very much as people of this world and that this is a capacity that all people have and we have to guard against. And so to me, that was a very humanizing thing. Like this is a birthday present, but it is still virulently anti-Semitic and in service of this ideology. And I, I, it just struck me in a really profound way. So when I think about what I learned from the Holocaust, sometimes it's, a, um, it's not a new fact, but it's kind of this um, deepening of a sense of the meaning so that, that was the thing that hit me most. And Sheldon Anger is um, next on the list in your eyes. In your view, what is the likelihood that Polish residents in the nearby town of Oz, was, I'm not sure if I can say Oshie that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Could not know what was going on at Auschwitz as they now claim. Right. Um, so I'm going to lead by saying that I don't have um, a factual answer to this. I don't know the answer. So what I'm about to say is my um, educated kind of speculation on the answer. My first thought is I'm not sure to what degree they were allowed to continue residing in Auschwitz during this period. It's not unusual for the local population to be forcibly removed to a different space. So I don't know if that happened to the non-Jewish Poles in Auschwitz or not. Having said that, in general, what did people know about the Holocaust, especially people that were in close proximity to these facilities? They knew something was wrong. They, they may not have known exactly that there was a specific murder mechanism, but they know people went there and they didn't come back. We have good testimony from people. I think about um, the documentary Shoah, where Claude Landsman interviews Polish peasants, Polish farmers who lived very near Treblinka. And they talk about seeing things and, and knowing things and how they would, in some cases, interact with Jews that were going by on the rail cars and making a slit throat motion, kind of um, taunting that their death was coming. So, and we see the same evidence out of the Yahad and Unum project, the, the Father Dubois project where he's interviewing locals who were witnesses to the Einsatzgruppen shootings. There's a fairly high degree of knowledge um, across Europe. The, the question of degree can be debated, but there's a high level of knowledge. Next question is, um, from Susan, out of the Nazis who were captured and interrogated, what was what was the extent, if any, okay. or remorse if they expressed? So most of the highest ranking Nazis were not captured. Hitler, Himmler, um, Goebbels, Mengele, these are all people who um, killed themselves or got away. Some of the biggest um, as we look back on it, some of the biggest names, for instance, Rudolf Hess is captured and he is taken back to Poland, tried on the grounds at Auschwitz and executed at Auschwitz. I shouldn't say, I believe he was tried in Poland. I don't know if he was tried at Auschwitz, but he was executed at Auschwitz. Um, if you look at something like the first Nuremberg trial, the International Military Tribunal, um, we talk about that a lot in Holocaust education, but the truth is that that was more about war crimes than it was about genocide in the Holocaust. The highest ranking Nazi official there was Hermann Goering, who had a lot of control over Jewish policy in the 1930s before it was handed off to the SS and given to Reinhard Heydrich. Um, potentially the second highest ranking person that's very directly connected to the Holocaust at the IMT would have been Ernst Kaltenbrunner who replaced Heydrich as head of the RSHA after Heydrich's assassination in 1942. Um, what we do see though, in the 12 subsequent Nuremberg trials, so the primary kind of four, four country commission moved on, but the Americans stayed and Ben Ferenc prosecuted, uh, again, gathered evidence and was participant in these um, trials. They were more closely tied to the Holocaust. 
and they were more specific. So we have a trial of doctors. We have a trial of industrialists. Um, I will tell you that once you start looking into post-war justice, nobody's, nobody feels very good about it. Um, after the International Military Tribunal, there are not many executions. Largely, there are, sh are short prison sentences that are largely commuted. So um, in terms of what might feel like more satisfying justice, there's not much to be had in the post-war world. Um, along with your comments, Dan Reich ha has said, um, I believe that Hess was interrogated by St. Louis and Whitney Harris. That's just a comment on, on some of the things you just said. And then the next question, can you speak to how gays and lesbians were treated? Yes, uh, and that is something I did not cover because I was talking specifically about Auschwitz, but it is something that is covered in the exhibition more globally. Our victims who were persecuted um, in other camps and for other reasons. So largely the queer experience of the Holocaust is not at Auschwitz it's more likely to happen in the German concentration camps. Um, we have traditionally thought of it as very much targeting gay men, but there is some new evidence that I, I wish I could speak more um, eloquently about, but I, I am not the person, uh, I just don't, I don't have that in my head. Um, but starting to look at how it affected women uh, as well, we actually, if this is something you're interested in, we have um, actually three presentations I should tell you about. We're, we're conducting what we're calling the Auschwitz Speaker Series and a great deal of it's happening on Zoom. But we have an expert joining us on the Roma experience, on the disabled experience, and on the queer experience. They're each going to do a separate presentation and then they're participating in a panel together to kind of weave together how these experiences speak to each other. Um, and I can put in the chat the link if you would like to sign up for any of these Zooms. We'd love to have you. Well, and if also if you um, send it to me in an email, I can send it to the participants as well that were Wonderful. here to, here today. So that might be another idea. Um, and one more question, I believe we can um, fit. Do we know from this one's from Harvey? Do we know how many Jewish prisoners are still living? You know, there are people who try really hard to figure that out, and I, I never feel very comfortable with their numbers. So here's, here's what I will tell you. In Kansas City, we have approximately 100 Jewish survivors still living. Um, so I, that I feel like I can, I can honestly tell you. I, I know my community. Um, in terms of a global number or a United States number, you'll see different numbers in different places. Um, maybe somebody here has a good number for St. Louis. Um, I don't know. Thank you so much. I am going to turn the um, this program over to Amy Lutz, who has a few more things to say from the Jewish Federation. Hey, everybody. Um, as many of you are already familiar with the Holocaust Museum, I will be very quick on this and just talk about some of our upcoming programs. Um, if I haven't uh, met uh, you on this call, although I've met a lot of people on this call. I am the communications and social media manager for the St. Louis Kaplan Feldman Holocaust Museum. Um, I can say as a staff, we are very excited to visit the Auschwitz exhibit in Kansas City at the end of the month. We're going on a road trip, very exciting. Um, and we actually set up a separate trip on August 16th, which is designed for volunteers, but we actually have a few seats left. Um, and I know as Jessica probably mentioned before the presentation, the, the exhibit is, is sold out for the most part during the summer. Um, and so if you're interested, uh, my colleague Lori Cooper just posted a link for that trip. We have like seven seats left, something like that on August 16th. So take a look at that. Um, also in August, we just announced this, I think yesterday, we have a very exciting speak, speaker series coming up. It's all virtual, all on Zoom uh, starting August 5th. We have four different uh, virtual uh, programs under the header. Um, it's called the Why This Matters Speaker Series. Uh, it's really kind of an early launch of, you know, a year out from our, our reopening. And the first three topics are on anti-Semitism, 
uh, Holocaust education and media literacy, uh, three issues that are very important and also very closely tied to, to our museum. And then the final um, presentation on August 26th in the evening, these are all in the evening, will be with museum designer Patrick Gallagher, whose team is designing our new museum. And it will be a sneak peek and overview um, of some of the new renderings and the plans for the Holocaust Museum. So we're very excited about that. Um, you would just have to go to our website, stlholocaustmuseum.org, or visit us on social media for more information. Uh, but we hope you all can join us. And for purposes of time, I will stop there. Jessica, I want to thank you on behalf of the Fell Group, the Mirowitz Center, and the Jewish Federation for such a wonderful program today with so much information and such a wonderful presentation you have given us. Thank you so very much. We really appreciate all the all the wonderful wealth of information that you have shared. Um, and if anyone has any further questions, you can always email me. I can forward them to Jessica if you come up with something that comes to mind at a later time. Um, and again, thank you so, so very much. We appreciate it very much. It was a wonderful program. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks. Bye, everyone.